as we think about the next steps and the next challenges and the next seasons in our life, I would ask you this morning, where is the next step for you? What's going on in your life? What is, where is God at work in your life? We've been looking at this, this book of Joshua, and we've been keying in on the word next. Now, that's a very um, common word, and it wouldn't seem to have a whole lot of impact or meaning. But in the book of Joshua, the word next, N-E-X-T, has tremendous impact as you study this, because it's a word that we find strategically placed in the text that's always a word that describes the action of the people in direct and e immediate response to God's direction in their life. The next thing, for instance, as we'll see in this next chapter, chapter 6, verse 12, Joshua got up early, and you can take about any translation out there, and it'll say, the next morning, in response to what has just come before that, destructions from God, Joshua gets up early the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. And what we begin to learn from the book of Joshua is how we respond to the next step in our lives determines your future. And as a church, listen to me church, what you do about the next step that God's dealing with in your life determines our future as a church. Because you see, God honors the community. He doesn't just honor individuals. He honors the individuals as we respond in obedience. And what we do, the Bible says, we do not live to ourselves, nor do we die to ourselves. What we do impacts the whole. And so we begin to discover that the future is before us, and it matters what happens. Now, as you, uh, we prepare to look at this, I want you to do something right now. This is something that some of you all wanted to do many times, and you're going to get permission to do it now. You see these notes? You got your notes out? I want you to take your pen. You ready for this? Some of you have been waiting for this for a long, long time. Uh, see where it says, to engage? I want you to take your pen and just write it about the two just mark a big old X across the bottom of that paper. Yeah, you can do that. You've always wanted to do that. We're knocking out that whole part of the sermon today. You got that? I just wanted you to know that ahead of time. I was getting ready this morning and felt strongly impressed by the Lord not to go to two today. I wanted to stick on one for a little while. I don't know all the imports, but I've learned to just listen to the impressions of the Spirit. So we're going to stay, I'm going to be obedient to that this morning, and we're going to deal with one. I pastored a church some years ago, which was facing the need for expansion. God had been blessing, people were getting saved, we had drug dealers coming, and, and, and they were getting transformed, and we had people come in our life out of terrible abusive backgrounds whose lives were being transformed and healed until their physical appearance changed. The, the way they looked, the way they dressed was changing because of what Jesus was doing in their life and the healing that they were getting. And we were seeing the whole town in a, in a relatively small town. The, the, the church was having an impact on the whole town in some powerful and wonderful ways. And we were seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. And in fact, it had begun to explode, and we had gone to double services. We were holding two services to be able to accommodate all of the crowd that was coming at that particular time in our history. And as a part of that, there was the need for some expansion for the future. We were landlocked, terribly landlocked. We had a dilapidating building that was uh, o over 80 years old that had had some electrical problems and there was issues that we were facing for the future and uh, so we were looking at all of that 
And we were praying that God would give us direction in this area. Out on the edge of town in the developing part of the city where it was expanding was some acreage farm ground, prime farm ground right on the highway, right next to the nursing home, a particular place. And as I learned about that piece of property, I said, Lord, wouldn't it be wonderful if the church of the Nazarene could be out on that land in that place? I began to to, to inquire about who owned that land. Found out it was a 75-year-old widow lady in New York State. And when they found out what I was thinking, I was warned, don't call her. We've tried. And every I found out that all of the churches, almost all of the churches in the whole town in the previous 15 years that had, had been in building projects had tried to buy that, some of that land off of that woman in New York State. And she had told them without hesitation, no, it's not for sale, not going to be for sale. And so I was warned not to, not to try to pursue that, that that was off limits, that we weren't going to go there, that that couldn't happen. And one morning I woke up and I was in my prayer time and I felt the impression of the Spirit of God who said to me, Lire, I want you to get that lady's number and I want you to call her today. And I just kind of brushed it off. It's, I get impressions from time to time. And, you know, they come and go and you get impressions. But I've learned over the years that there are moments and times when the impression gets stronger and it won't go away. And I've learned to recognize that it is the Spirit of God that is impressing me. In those areas. And that was one of the... I could not get away. I couldn't study. I couldn't eat my lunch. I couldn't do anything. And the impression was, you need a caller. Do it today. Never met her in my life. Didn't know her any, any, anything about her. But I got the number. And I called her up. And I called her by name. And I said, I'm Leroy Glendening. I'm the pastor of the church in Nazarene. And I named the particular town. And I said, uh, my understanding is you own a number of acres out here on, uh, on, on the particular highway that goes north and south in the town. And I said... Um, um, I don't know, I've never met you before, but our church is interested in needing to expand and needing to build and for the future and uh, wondering, I, I just called to ask you, just felt like I wanted to call and ask you, would you be willing to sell us 10 of that acres, 10 of those acres on that particular area? There was a long pause and I thought, here it comes, <laughs> it's a bust. And the lady on the other end of the phone said to me, Pastor, I've never met you in my life, and I've told all the others no. I said, I know. The answer has been no. But I'm asking you again. There was another long pause. And she said, Lee Ray, I don't know why. I can't explain this, but I'm inclined to say yes to selling you the land on the highway. And I'm going, Woo. She said, I'll send my son out from Maryland. He does my business for me and he'll, he'll talk to you about the terms. And sure enough, a few days later, she sent her son. He flew out from Maryland, the state of Maryland, and he came out to the little town and we met with the board and we met with the church and we went out and looked over the land and decided where it would be divided and how it should be divided and what it would be and we came to the price and the terms. And we voted on it and we bought the land. We had some in our church, there was somebody in our church who didn't think that that was a wise move and who went to the bank who had had influence in the bank for a number of years and tried to talk the banker out of loaning us the money because he said they won't be able to pay it they'll go bankrupt the reality was in less than three years we had paid off the entire amount of that piece of property it was nothing short of a miracle of God because of the willingness to be obedient to the Spirit of God at a strategic moment in the next step
for the life and the ministry of the church. Some of us live not in the voice of the Spirit, but we live at the end of our pencils and our logic, or we live hoping for a stroke of good luck. Kind of like calling 200-200 at WHO with the, with the keyword for the day to get a grand in your hand. Anybody tried that? I, I've been punching that in. Big deal. Who knows? Some of you are like the golfers, four golfers I heard about that went out to a tee box and they were golfing on the 16th fairway and to their right was a, was a bike path and right beyond that was a highway. And so they all stepped up to the 16th tee box and and they decided that the leader should, should tee off, and so he did. And sure enough, his ball took off to the right. It bounced on the cart path, or the, the jogging path, and went over onto the highway and hit the wheel of a moving bus and bounced back, clear back across into the fairway. And they all stood there in shock and looked at him. And one of them finally got it out of his mouth. How in the world did you do that? And he kind of looked around, looked away, and nonchalantly said, Well, guys, you just have to learn the bus schedule. Some of us live in our spiritual lives hoping we get a lucky bounce. in the hits of life. What is the wall that will not come down in your life? Joshua chapter 6 starts out with these words, and the city of Jericho was tightly shut so that no one could go in and no one could come out. The, 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 the Hebrew writer here is making it clear that this is an impossible situation. Nobody's going in. Nobody's going out. This thing is blocked. This thing is off limits. This thing is shut up. This thing, is, there, there is no way in and there is no way out. It is shut tightly. And some of you are living with those kinds of situations in your life right now. The impossible situation. It may be some health issue in your life. It may be your marriage. There is no resolve, no impact. There is a division that you have not been able to overcome in your life. It may be your kids that are out of control. It may be the lost loved ones you've been praying for for years and years and years and years and years. And it's, you've quit praying for them. It's impossible. They're never going to believe. Their hearts are hard. They're not even budging. They're not even moving in that direction. I had one of those happen to me this week. Finally made some contact and discovered that someone I've been praying for, that something I'd said a year and a half ago offended them. And they had broken off the contact. And when I found out in the family what I had said, it was, it was not my intent at all, but it had offended them. And so we opened up for another hour and a half in which I was able to to begin to repair the mending of that, that that God could use to move. It was a new open door that would move that person closer to the kingdom of God. What is it in your life? Have you ever thought about you may be the one who is blocking the next move of the person you're praying for? Ask God about that. I never would have known if I hadn't called him and opened up the conversation it wasn't fun and comfortable, but I felt impressed that day to make that phone call. And he was open. 
What if the resolve in your, your situation is conditioned upon your response? What if God is asking you to do something specifically in your situation, which is the key? What if you're the key and your response, your next response is the key to the walls coming down in the situation that you've been wrestling with for a long, long time? What test are you facing which will determine your response in your future? There are some principles in the book of Joshua 6 that begin to indicate to us the conditions in which walls come down. Even though the gates are tightly shut and the walls are high, there are conditions that when we respond to the voice of God and His instructions and we obey what He says, the walls will come down. What are those conditions? There's a number of them. We'll get to one today. Walls come down when you really come to know who God is. Walls come down when you come to know really who God is. Why do I say that? You say, Pastor, what, what's the big deal with that? We go to church, we're here, we pray. We're good folks. We love Jesus. We care about the church. What do you mean, know who God is? We know who, I believe in God. Well, so do the demons. The demons believe in God. Did you know that the Bible says the demons believe in God and they tremble? It's not enough to believe in God. The question is, do you believe God? Has there developed a relationship that, that, that influences every decision in your life, every step of your life, every day of your life? Are you in tune with the God of the universe to the point that He can speak to you in a moment and you know it's Him and you obey? Do you know God like that? Now, the reason I raise this issue is because right here in the book of Joshua, this is, this is a, a, a strange chapter that we in the church do weird things with. Because right out of the chute, we have to deal with the nature of who this God is that we serve. Right out of the chute, when you, if you read this seriously... It will slam into the modern sensitivities and the political correctness and our sensitivities to justice. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Look at Joshua chapter 6. The gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. Why were they afraid? No one was allowed to go in or out, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and its strong warriors. Don't, don't gloss over what was just said there. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Now, go down to verse 17. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed, either by destroying them or by giving them as an offering. Similarly, it is an, as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Verse 18. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into His treasury. So they completely destroyed everything in it with their swords. Uh-oh, 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 watch this. Time to get your protest signs out. Time to march on Washington. Time to do something. This, this can't be right. What kind of a God is this? And with their swords, men and women, 
Young and old, cattle, sheep, goats, and donkeys were destroyed, and the Israelites burned the town down and everything in it, and only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. And at this time, Joshua invoked this curse. May the curse of the Lord fall on anyone who tries to rebuild the town of Jericho at the cost of his firstborn son. He will lay its foundation at the cost of his youngest son. He will set up its gates. If you want to read history, there have been those who tried to rebuild Joshua and they lost their children. It happened. What kind of a God is this? The God who wants the jewelries and the gold and he wants all the minerals and he wants all the costly, but he, but he, but he, but he doesn't give a rip about men and women and goats and animals. He just kills them all, but be sure and get the gold, get the money. What kind of a God is this that we serve? It reads like a genocide. Or it reads like a powerful people who are massacring poor, innocent people people including women and children and, and this is probably the most critiqued scripture in all of scripture both in the church and out of the church how do we handle this there are some churches and some theological beliefs you say does it matter what you believe I mean we're not getting the theological degree it doesn't matter what you believe well you check it out there are some who will say well well this passage, it's not the same God in the Old Testament as it was in the New Testament. This God is kind of a bloodthirsty God. And it's not the same God who was the father of Jesus Christ. And so they split the Old and New Testament. Now you got a whole other problem. Because how do you reconcile that with this is the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then there are others who will say, well... It's just a total mystery. We don't understand. God is God and He's sovereign and He has the right to do anything He wants to do. And, and we just have to, we just kind of have to accept this because this is, God doesn't always tell us why He does what He does. And so then we live with this schizophrenic view of God that, we, that something inside us resists that kind of injustice. And yet we want to sing, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good I don't get his contradictions but he's so good and something inside of us burrs and we sit in church and we go through all of this stuff but something inside of us says I'm not sure I like this God who is this God and outside the church I've heard it often they'll read this story and they come to this place in Joshua, and it's, it, it's thrown in my face probably at least once every three months, if not every month. And some months, it's been every week. And somebody will say to me, that's the reason why I'm not a Christian. That's why I'm not a part of the church, because I can't stand it when you read. How do you reconcile this kind of God who does this kind? I could never believe in a God who would do something like that. It's a massive issue. And it's easy to skip over, and it would be real easy, as many preachers have done, that we preach about the walls coming down and the wonderful victory, and we just kind of skim over that part. But you can't dodge it when you're preaching through the Bible. You can't just say, oh, well, they were on holy ground, and so let's just take it as it is. And the question comes up, do I even want that kind of a God messing with my walls? Do I even want that kind of a God messing with my family? What's he going to do to my family? What's he going to do to my life? Well, what, what if he does that stuff in my life and in my family? And, and, and I don't think it's very nice and I don't think it's very just. It's certainly not very loving. Is this genocide? Or is this massacre? Or is it possible it's neither? Let's look at that. Genocide. What is genocide? A genocide is an oppression 
of one people who decide they don't like a certain ethnic group and so we move in we've had those issues in Bosnia and Serbia we don't like a certain nationality of people or a certain race of people and so we move in to totally annihilate them without question of their value we just take them out we've seen that in our history all the way from Germany and Hitler in the last century to modern day genocides in the countries I name. Is that what's happening here in Joshua 6? God using Israel to annihilate the Canaanites? The answer is no. That's clearly not the case because all around Canaan are all kinds of ethnic groups that God is evicting them all. He's not picking on the Canaanites. He's evicting them all. So it cannot be a genocide. Well, then is it a massacre? Well, usually a massacre is defined as a militant group that's very powerful who moves in in conquest to take over the oppressed and the weak and the helpless and, and to, to totally decimate them and, and to destroy them so that they can take whatever they want and establish themselves for their own selfish ends. They take what's not theirs for their own selfish gain because it has the minerals or the oil or something else and they just take it over. Is that what's going on here? It doesn't fit. It's precisely the opposite. Israel is by far away not a militant military nation. In fact, they've been homeless for 40 years. They have a few weapons, but it doesn't even begin to match the instruments that the Jericho has. They're the, they're the oppressed. They're the ones who have, have, have lived in weakness in their life. You can't call it a massacre because it's not the powerful oppressing the weak. Actually, God is using the weak to overcome the powerful, abusive citadels of evil in His created world. So here's the story of God working with a weak and homeless people to evict evil and to make space for what? To make space for salvation, to make space for redemption, to make space that would eventually birth the Messiah, that would bring salvation to everybody in, in the world, whosoever will. That's God's purpose at this very point. And if one opposes God's purpose of salvation and resists that, then you find yourself in opposition to God, the God who wants to save you. And if you oppose that, then eventually he evicts you. You're evicted from his redemptive saving plan in your life. And God's been doing that all through history. Ever since Genesis chapter 1, when Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to do it their way. They wanted to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God wanted them to eventually. But God had said, no, not till it's time. You're not able to handle it yet. You're not grown up enough yet. There's a time coming. I want you to, to enjoy all that I have, but you've got to take it in the timing and the steps. And Adam and Eve said, no. We, we, we want to know it all now. We want to be like you now. We want to be all grown up and mature now. We can handle it. And they ate of it. And the Bible says that when they ate of it, God evicted them from the garden. Why did he do that? Because he's a mean God? No, because he did not want them going back to the tree of life in their condition of being evil and rebellious and eating from the tree of life and being locked in and beyond redemption and salvation. So what did he do? He evicted them out of Eden and sent, sent the army of angels with swords, burning swords, to make a big X on the front entrance of the Garden Eden. So they, and the Bible says he did it so they wouldn't go in and eat from the tree of life and, and put in concrete their rebellion and disobedience. God's been doing this from the beginning. And he does that to anyone who opposes 
his redemptive plan because he loves us so much. He doesn't want to live without us. And so he moves to redeem us, to save us, and he has to remove anything that is against his salvation plan in our lives. So we find ourselves in an extreme broken world because of Adam and Eve. And when that took place, what God is saying, he brings us to a place where he enters that brokenness. And we see not only abuse of power, we see injustice, we see people organize it politically, we see it the oppression, the slavery, the hatred, that even the murder that begins to happen outside the Garden of Eden after he evicts them from that place. And this evil moves throughout the world and it becomes a broken world every place around. So I would say to you this morning, this is not genocide. This is not a massacre. God is using weak people to overcome the abusive powers and evil in his created world that has been perverted from the good that he first created it to be. And you need to understand that Jericho is not some sleepy, innocent little town with a big, mean, bloodthirsty God who decides to pick on them and take it over for his spoiled kids. Jericho is a military base. In other words, the people that lived in this city had dedicated their lives to fighting battles for their gods. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. Two, over 2,000 years old, it's a symbol of military might. The Canaanites had built Jericho as, as the fort that they believed was invincible and that their God would protect. Two walls. They didn't just build a wall. Jericho's walls were two walls. 32 feet high, 20 feet thick. 20 feet. You could put a chariot on both of them. They've created this double wall. It's the strongest, most fortified city in Palestine. And it's at the gateway to the whole region. If it's defeated, all the other cities would go down. If it was taken, they would split the land in half. This is not God sending his people into innocent villages and huts. He's overtaking a military base full of people that are willfully there to defend in war this area and Jericho is an evil city go back to Joshua 2 we looked at that several weeks ago the king of Canaan had every intention to submit to the God of Israel that was coming in peace and in salvation if he wanted to, but he refused to do it. And in fact, he, he took some overt evil direction and only Rahab got it. She understood what was at stake. She saw the God that, that, that wants to love and to pervert, preserve. She saw the God of salvation. But her leaders did not. And so he wants to control God. The leader of Canaanites wants to control God. He wants to, to, to control their gods. And so he didn't want to worship the God of Israel. He wanted to create his own God. His name was Komesh. They sacrificed their children to this God. He's leading his people to worship a God that they think they control by killing and dancing and sacrificing to in their lives. There's no cooperation here. It's in opposition. And they become the devil to the people of God. And they, they've built this tower, a stronghold called Jericho. And the people of God could never begin to experience all that God had for them until they overcame this symbol, this obstacle of evil in their life. In fact, if you read the rest of this story that we'll look in detail next Sunday. He had them march six times around Jericho, which is the mercy of God saying to the Canaanites, you can reverse this if you want. You can surrender if you want. The mercy of God. He doesn't want to annihilate them. He doesn't want to kill them. He doesn't want to take them out. Here's the mercy of God. 
And he sends those people around in six days. Talk about six days of mercy. Six days of mercy that's surrounding that place. And so here is this small military base in which Israel's coming against it with puny little weapons. It would be like sending our desert storm troops into Iraq several years ago with squirt guns, water guns. That's what we're up against here. God's not going in and rampaging innocent cities and massacring innocent people. And the Canaanites knew exactly what was happening. Rahab was in their midst. She had preached to them. This, this was not just a ragtag bunch of guerrillas. Fearful. They were fearful of God. They had shut up the gates. They had deliberately set themselves against the God of Israel. They were the ones in history who had pressed for 400 years the children of Israel. I wouldn't be okay with you oppressing my children for four minutes. It had happened to them for 400 years. And the Israelites had come out of, God, out of Egypt where God's people had oppressed and forced them into slavery. And they suffered great injustice. And God moves them out to a land ruled by the Canaan. And gives Canaan an opportunity to be a part of the rescue operation. But they would not. They shut the doors tightly on the move of God in their life. And it's interesting that Israel, this isn't their first rendezvous with evil in their lives. Forty years before, their mom and dads had come to this place in their lives, and Jericho was the place they would have to go. And the parents said, no, we can't fight evil. We can't stand up against evil. The evil is like giants, and we're like grasshoppers. We can't stand up to evil in our lives. We can't overcome Jericho in our lives. And it becomes that 603,000 fighting men won't stand up to the millions caught up in a regime against the salvation of God. And so they end up dying in the desert as wonders because of their unbelief. And the Hebrew writer makes this very abundantly clear in chapter 3. He says the reason the Israelites couldn't enter the promised land the first time was because of their lack of faith. Look at this. And who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their what? Unbelief. They were not able to enter his rest. Faith and obedience becomes the key to the victory. So God through Joshua gives the people instructions, very specific instructions. But in the military world of the time, the instructions are just plain weird. How do you, how do you, how do you overcome cities and walls? I'll tell you how you do it. You have to get an army to build dirt ramps. You have to get somebody to build siege towers that you can get up to the height of the wall so your soldiers can go over that. You have to get the weaponry. You have to stockpile a warehouse of ladders and grappling hooks and ropes. That's how you do it. Everybody knows that's how you do it. Israel has none of it. Doesn't have any of those tools. They have no technology. They don't have any equipment. Nobody will trade with them. No, no, nobody's, everybody's afraid of them and opposed to their success. And they've been slaves and 40 years homeless in the desert. And they have nothing to get through the thick shut up walls in their life. And yet God comes along and says, okay, folks, I know you don't have a thing. You don't have what it takes to get the job done. But I'm giving you the city. I'm giving you the land. And the way you're going to do it is, 
you're going to get up every morning for six days and you're going to go do march around and you're going to march around in silence and you're going to you're, you're going to do this and act like you're going to own the land even though there's no way that you can get this pulled off you don't have any equipment you don't have enough money you don't have enough finances you don't have enough contacts you don't have anybody willing to work in your in your court you don't have anybody in your favor but I want you to start acting like you've got everybody in your court and you got all the money in the world and you've got all the technology and you've got it all I want you to start getting up and acting like it you know what he's saying to them He's saying, you're going to have to enter the supernatural and trust me. But the condition is obedience and participation. Can I tell you this morning that this is the same God who came up against the evil in the human heart and the walls of the human heart the Bible says desperately wicked incapable of any good totally depraved self-centered God came up against the rebellion of the human heart that the walls are shut tight and he said this is the way we're gonna handle it I'm going to send my servant. I'm going to send my son. His name is Jesus. He's going to get into their flesh. He's going to get into the human being. Who ever heard of a God who becomes like the one that, 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 is, that, that is evil? How, how does he do that? He becomes flesh. God speaks into that with the miracle, supernatural miracle of the virgin birth. Who ever had a baby out of, out of being a virgin? He comes into the world in a human being and in the, in the person of Jesus Christ and he sends this, this son of his out to spread the message. It says, the kingdom of God is at hand. And everybody looks around and says, it doesn't look like it to me. Look at the evil over here. Look at the Romans over here. Look at, look at the hypocrites in the church. Look at this. Look at that. It doesn't look to me like the kingdom of heaven has come. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is here. Believe me. Well, how's that going to work? Jesus did something really weird. He lays down his life. And the Bible says he did it in obedience to the Father. He lays down his life. He becomes the victim or the appearance of a victim. He becomes synonymous with the oppressed. He becomes the weakness of human flesh. He cries in the garden, Father, please let me out of this mess. Do we have to go through with it? I know we talked about it in eternity, but I don't want to do it now. Can I back out? Could you take me back? And the Bible says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. But he didn't. No, he lays his life down. Why? Because he trusted in his father. And it says in the scriptures that it was God who raised Jesus out of the grave and out of the dead to defy all of the evil in the world, to defy death and everything related to death. And Jesus came back from the dead on the third day to rule and reign and eliminate evil in our lives and to give us salvation and a hope of eternal life and a home in heaven. Woo! This is the God who has been moving all through history to do everything in his power to even bankrupt heaven in order to save us from the evil and the sin and the brokenness of our world. I want to ask you this morning, what is your wall? What's your view of God? You got God in a little box? 
that he has to play into your sensitivities and your opinions and your political persuasion and he has to be the God who's defined by, by the way you won't think he ought to act. You'll never know the miracle of God in your life. Do you really know this God who invites you into the supernatural to begin to do some things and to experience some things in your life that you won't experience down at the bank, that you won't experience because of the ballot box, that you won't experience because you, you, you have planned so well. He wants to invite us into the supernatural to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or even think according to His power that is at work in us through His Spirit. And I would say to you this morning, I, I was praying in these last few weeks. I was asking God, is there a better way for GLC and ICA to put a partnership together than some of the, the processes and the struggles? Would you, have, would you have in your supernatural power something that would go beyond anything any of us have thought about? That would make a win-win situation for everybody involved that we couldn't find at the bank, that we couldn't find in our board meetings, that something supernatural. And here's what the Spirit of God said to me. Yeah, I can do that, but it's conditioned on one thing. Your obedience. I said, Lord, what's that look like? He said, I'm not telling you. I'll tell you what you need to do, but you can't tell all the other folks. But he said to me, tell the people that there's someone in this congregation this morning that's the key to breaking through into a miracle in a direction that, that would just, just, just blow your minds. I don't know who it is. I don't know how it is. I don't know what it works. But God said to me, tell the people that there's somebody in this crowd on this Sunday morning that you, God's been talking to you in your life. God's been talking to you about some things in your life. And you've, you've backed away. You, you've stood aside. You've tried to dodge it. You've danced around it. You've tried to rationalize it. You, you, but it keeps coming back. And God has asked you to do something. I don't know what it is. God has asked you to do something. And you are the key of obedience that will break down the walls and open up some gates so that others can begin to be obedient as well. Is it you? I've already asked him, is it me? What is it? The Spirit of God. Do you really know him? Or do you just know about him? You believe in him? Or do you believe him? Well, it doesn't work out on paper. Well, it, doesn't, it isn't the way we do it. it, isn't, it, it we don't have the resources to do that. Well, what if God decided he wanted to give us those resources? But it's key to obedience. That's what we talked about in the, the Forward in Faith campaign, isn't it? It was obedience to the direct voice of God in our lives. What did he say to us? Many of us responded to that. God asked Lisa and I to do something that was just totally out of I mean, when he asked us to do it, when we were praying about it, it was like crazy. We can't give that kind of money. We don't have that kind of stuff. But we knew it was the voice of God. And we stepped out. And God, God, you've heard the story. I don't have to tell it again. God worked a miracle. And both Lisa and my life in the material realm that opened up the doors for us to do and complete the commitments that he gave to us because we were obedient to the voice of God. And we stepped out in faith and obedience. And many of you did the same. And it's why we're where we're at this morning with what we do have. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, I've never really come to a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Well, you've got a model here, Rahab. You may be living in rank evil. You may be the only one in your home that's a Christian. 
You may be the only one in your home that really knows God. You may have relatives that go to church, believe all kinds of things, and they're religious and they're wonderful, good people in so many good ways, but they don't know God. You may be, they may think you're weird. They may think you're crazy. They may think you're stupid because you talk about something deeper than just this knowledge of believing in God. You know Him. You've heard His voice. You've lived, listened to Him. You've seen Him work in your life. You've seen Him do miracles in your life. And they think you're crazy. That's where Rahab was living. But because she obeyed, she was able to influence her family over time and talk them into the fact that they needed to believe in this God of Israel. And if they would, when the armies came, when evil came, when everything else was caving in and the walls had fallen down, she could be saved. Because of a scarlet cord. In the same way that you can be saved because there is the crimson blood of a man named Jesus who is fully God and fully man who sacrificed his life so that you could be set free and the walls could come down in your life and you could begin to be a part of the family of God. And it could happen to you this morning. You could simply say, dear Jesus, come into my life. Become master, savior, leader, and Lord. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I repent and turn from them. I want to begin to live for you. I want to get to know you. I want to know not just about you. I don't want to just believe in you. I want to believe you. I want to see what you can do in my life and in the life of my family. I give my life to you. The key is obedience. To the voice of God in your life.